Hey, hello! This is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration to help us in the process of getting students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I work at IE Business School Publishing, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. We're today with Scott Renke. He is the coordinator for the Ball State Achievements at Ball State University. Ball State Achievements is an awesome new approach to retention of at-risk students through mobile gamification. Scott has always been passionate about games and wants to leverage their power in higher education. Scott, are you prepared to engage? I am good to go. Good to hear. Scott, so let's, let's get started today with, with today's interview. The first thing that we wanted to know is how does a regular day with Scott look like? Sure. So uh, I run the Achievements Program here at Ball State. So my day is pretty much filled with, uh, with tending to the program in multiple ways. Most of my day is spent uh, communicating with students, you know, seeing if they have any issues in the app uh, or with buying store items or completing achievements or just generally seeing, you know, what they'd like to see in the app. A big part of my job is to coordinate uh, different areas of campus uh, to get their programming in the app. So I spend a lot of time talking to other directors and, and you know other divisions here at the university. When I have some downtime between that, I usually spend that um, researching gamification and games, uh, you know, watching YouTube videos on game design, and <laughs> reading articles, and also trying to hone my skills. I'm, I'm kind of a jack of all trades. So, you know, I try to keep up to speed with certain development and design techniques, as well as just writing for conferences or papers, um, designing for the app, or just generally, you know, coming up with marketing campaigns for the students to try to get them engaged. Scott, you mentioned the Ball State Achievements app. Can you give us a quick overview of what this app looks like and what is, what is it about? Yeah, so the Ball State Achievements app was launched in fall of 2014. Um, the idea was that for low-income students, there is a higher impact for them engaging with the university, meaning that they see higher degrees of success the more engaged they are at the university. And we were trying to move the dial on their retention rates, uh, so retaining them from freshman to sophomore year and beyond, uh, to try to get better four-year graduation rates. So you, so, you found out that uh, if, if they were more engaged with the university, they were actually had a higher tendency to, to remain in the university, right? Yeah, and that's a pretty you know obvious thing, I think. Uh, you know, that makes sense. But the, what the research we found showed was that uh, you know for any student, that's true, but it's actually even more impactful when you look at lower ability, low income students. Awesome. So, yeah, so the, the app, what it does is engage the students with the university and, and what, again, a very general, can you tell us what it does to keep them engaged with, with Ball State? Yeah, so, so in the app, uh, we have a bunch of different goals and tasks called achievements. And those can be anything from uh, exploring campus landmarks, finding instructional buildings, meeting with your academic advisor, going to football games, getting all A's and B's. I mean, we really try to encompass everything uh, at the university. So when they complete those achievements, they get a currency called Benny's, uh, and they can use that currency to purchase real stuff from the Ball State bookstore, tech store, and uh, rec center. So stuff that actually costs cash, they can buy it with Benny's. Yes. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So um, once now that we know what you're doing, what the app looks like, we want to go back a bit into your into your history and know sure. for, for you to tell us the story of maybe the worst application of game thinking or gamification that you've ever participated in. And here you don't have to say any names if you don't want to, if you have any NDAs or anything. We want sure. more. The, the main thing here is the experience. What happened and what are the, the key learnings from that? Sure. So uh, I, I do have a story, and it's kind of a, a happy ending story. It's a comeback story, I guess. But um, the best. So ones. I worked in a yeah yeah. So I worked in a restaurant. I've worked in a lot of restaurants, but I worked in one restaurant in particular, and um, they had a contest every year to sell uh, margaritas, alcoholic drinks. Okay. Uh, I was I was a server uh, at this restaurant, and it was a really great contest. Like I, it really got me engaged. The way it worked was. 
if you sold a uh, regular margarita, you got like 10 points. A specialty was, I think, 30. And then their top, top shelf signature margarita was 50 points. And what was interesting was they split people up into teams. There were team leaders on each team. Uh, each shift they would run, you know, special games like bingo and hangman and things like that uh, to try to encourage those like short term, you know, push sales for particular shifts. Um, as well as, you know, they would have shift meetings where they would announce, you know, so and so's in the lead, this team's in the lead, this person sold a whole bunch on Saturday. Uh, and then ultimately some winners would win. I think there was like a trip to Florida or something was like the big sales, big sales uh, prize. Uh, and it went really, really well. And for me, you know, it, it encouraged me to sell more, uh, encouraged pretty much everybody there. You know, you felt happy for other people. Um, so very competitive that, bunch, I guess. Yeah, well, it was competitive and it was cooperative because you had your teams. Uh, and there really was a feeling of being on the same team and all together. And they would even show the numbers between our store and other stores. Uh, and it was just really well designed. You know, the, the best gamification, the best game design, I think, is simple and sure. uh, and doesn't necessarily use technology. You know, Tag is one of the most fun games ever made. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's super simple. Zero um, technology. Yeah, or thumb wrestling, rock, paper, scissors, you know. And uh, the floor is lava. And uh, so, okay, so here's where things went uh, bad. About a, you know, a couple years later, uh, they went under new ownership and there were some changes made to, you know, a lot of things around the store. And one of the things that they changed was they changed that, um, that campaign, that month uh, of competition. And they changed it to where, I can't, this was years ago, so I can't remember the exact details, but I know they changed the point structure to where, certain drinks were all the same. There weren't as many kind of uh, shift meetings where they talked about who was on the leaderboards and everything. It kind of just got whittled down to something that was printed out. So you got less and, like immediate feedback. The feedback loop was not as good as before. Yeah, there was less feedback. There was less, um, there was less uh, strategy involved with you know wanting to sell particular drinks. Um, and that eventually kind of came through Uh, in the numbers, you know, people were less enthused to participate. Um, you know, I don't think they hit the same quota that they did in years prior. And and it really, you know, at face value, it looked like exactly the same campaign. You know, like if you would have looked at it on the books and saw the leaderboards and everything, you'd think it was the same. And that's really where some of those small, you know, the game full design features that go into that like playing those little games between shifts and recognizing people's achievements um you know that's where those really matter that's where those really make the difference between you know the, the whole points badges and leaderboards argument of you know game design is more than that and I, th i think that really showed me like looking at it in retrospect uh how impactful some of those small details can be And, you know, the good part of that story is I do still have a lot of friends that work there. I have a friend that's a manager yeah. there. And he has told me, because I've, you know, I've expressed this grievance to him uh, in the past. And he said they have gone back and uh, they do take more care in their game design uh, it, with, with that competition now. So so they, they made a comeback. They learned their lesson, I think. So, Engagers, I, I, want, I want you to take from this for sure. This is my, my key learning here that just as well as you should iterate when you create something to improve it you have to also make sure that you're not deteriorating your initial material and, and it can happen you can you can tinker with some things and it goes wrong but that's precisely the point of iterating you can see something going wrong and you go back to something else or you try something new and different and see if it goes better so my key learning here is that you have to remember to keep iterating see and testing and checking what's working and what's not And always make sure that it doesn't mean that something, because it has, once again, as we've always said, points, badges, and leaderboards, it's gamification, and much less it's good gamification. Good gamification requires a lot of thought and many things and many elements that can be put together to create a great application of it. Scott, what do you think is, is the main learning from this lesson you, that you got? Well, <laughs> I, I think a lot of it is just communicating with your employees, communicating with your users, Um, and kind of having empathy and understanding how they feel. I think it's easy, especially, and, you know, this is a great example of gamification, too, because restaurants move fast, real fast. I mean, nobody has time. The, you know, management doesn't always have time to, to change course when you're in the middle of a busy season. 
and trying, even if you're busy, to take the time to talk to your users and find out how people feel about about your program, about your gamification strategy, uh, is always important. I mean, that needs to be you need to uh, budget that in. Yeah. Uh, to so to talk your to your users, right? That's yeah. that's fundamental. Talk to your users, know your users as much as you can, and continue to communicate with them because it's not just in the beginning, not just in the, the design. You have to make sure that when you iterate, if you're iterating, and that's fundamental, that you keep on on the right track, and that requires of your users. So Scott, mm -hmm. let, let's shift a bit now and sure. go into the, the next question, which is what's the biggest challenge that you, that you faced in, in your life and actually solved using gamification or game thinking? Sure. So uh, I'll actually use an example from the achievements program uh, awesome. for that question. So when we first launched the program, we had a lot of students download the app. So the app's completely voluntary, by the way. It's not required of these students. Um, so we had to kind of overcome the issue of marketing and getting students to join. Um, and we were able to do that. We, you know, we sent out some emails, messages, and everything. And uh, we actually, we, uh, we had a cool program where we used, are you familiar with Willy Wonka, the golden ticket? Yeah. So we actually physically created a letter with three golden tickets in it uh, and sent that <laughs> out to students and told them, uh, here is your special pass. Since you're now a member, we had like 200 at the time. Um, you have these three golden tickets, give them to whoever you want and they can join the app. Kind of like, you know, Gmail's campaign. And, sure. uh, and that was hugely effective. I think we like tripled our numbers. I think we got up to about 600 users after we did that. Yikes. Um, so, so that was a good way that we kind of overcame that challenge of getting people into the app. And then a different problem that arose was we had our users and they were completing achievements and, and that was great, but we didn't have students buying items from the store. And that was a problem in my opinion, because that was a huge part of what I felt was the core feedback loop of, you know, we wanted students to do these things and and get a reward you know for their efforts and, and then want to keep buying and and keep doing achievements and and you know understand the reward of their engagement well when i had first made the awards i, I had picked out the the awards to be in the app i wanted to put a lot of low ticket items in there so that there could be a quick feedback loop okay so i so i had stuff in there you know like t-shirts and even some smaller items like notepads and kind of like office items uh, you know, because they're students, they might need those from the bookstore. <laughs> well, I was wrong. They didn't buy any of that. Um, literally, I don't think an item was purchased under ten dollars. And so I had to, you know, we had to figure out what to do. And after talking to a lot of students, you know, one of them finally told me, "Look, I already have all this stuff, and I don't even want to walk out of my dorm and into the bookstore to go pick up an eraser." <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's not worth the effort. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, okay. I was like, well, what do you want? And so from talking to a few of the students, we got some more specialized rewards. Like we found some architecture equipment like T-squares and uh, nursing kits, uh, as well as some of the higher ticket items like, you know, nice shirts that are like 50 bucks or sweat or hoodies, um, as well as tech store items uh, like iPad minis and uh, Fitbits. And, wow. you know, and that was with me understanding, you know, the way that I made the point structure that it would take them a while to get that. But that drove students more. So students started completing more achievements because they were driven by those higher ticket items. It was meaningful and, for them, right? Yeah, yeah. It became more meaningful. And then what we're trying to do now uh, that's been effective is we're adding experiences as well. So through the rec center, you can purchase, we have like yoga classes and, you know, Zumba classes, things like that, uh, that are, that are not free to students because they're like led, you know, led courses. And so now students can purchase their fit passes through the app, as well as they can purchase, uh, like rock climbing trips through outdoor pursuits. Um, and we just added, we have a, a student run restaurant that has like a different menu every night of the week. Wow. Um, with kind of, uh, you know, high class cuisine kind of stuff. And so we started adding meal tickets for that. So you can buy dinner for one, two or four. So uh, in the basically here, what, what you realized was that the rewards that you were giving, the, the, the feedback that you got was that the rewards were not meaningful. 
But something yeah. I, I also wanted to point out, and I, I've heard Scott before because we met at Gamification World Congress about his, his app, is that you have to realize that all these items and all these things, they are meant to engage the students with the university. And again, the idea is that they do all these achievements to engage. But if they also go to the store and buy a hoodie that is from the university, of course, it makes them more committed to the university. They feel identified. So you can, you can see how the, this feedback loop goes, goes into a spiral, a positive spiral, exactly of what you want to. So if you can find these effects somewhere in your application of gamification or game thinking, this is like a golden ticket, basically, just like Willy Wonka. I'm sure yeah. if you can find that for, for, your, for, your, for your application, it's, it's basically like a golden ticket. It's not always possible. That's true. And I'm um, very happy that you had this opportunity, Scott. But it's definitely, I'm, I'm convinced that this is something that can improve the application and the engagement of your students, which is, in the end, the, the main objective. And you sti you're sticking to your objectives and getting the best out of it. So congrats for that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Scott. So now my next question has to do more with the process that you follow. We've, we've spoken about how you arrived to your conclusions, how you, you used your feedback. But I wanted to know if you have any process that you follow when you're going to apply game thinking to, to a situation? What, what do you do when you, when you want to solve a problem using game, game thinking? Sure. So the first thing is always to do research. Um, and a lot of this, you know, isn't even particular to applying game thinking. It's just kind of, you know, doing any kind of creative project in general. So, you know, always start out with research, uh, get on YouTube, get on the internet, uh, talk to people that you know that are kind of working in the field find case studies, see what they've done, uh, and see what other people have done in that area. And, and then and now you, you will have the opportunity to listen to Professor Game. That you can have other uh -huh. cases and other people knowing what they've done. So sorry for that interruption, Scott. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you should listen to Professor Game. would be the first, uh, <laughs> the first <laughs> research you do. So, you know, after, after you do some initial research and kind of thinking on the topic, I think it's important to start with talking to potential users uh, you know, get to know your, your user group, hopefully be a, you know, ideally be a part of that user group if you can be as much as you possibly can be. Um, I was a student at Ball State. Um, so that kind of helped, and a first generation student, Pell Grant student, everything like that. So, you know, that kind of helped me with achievements. Wow, um, of course. And then once you have talked to them and kind of gotten to know them, I think it's important to start putting them into player types. Try to think, you know, of the people that I talk to, what kind of players are they? What might be motivators for them? When I was talking to them about an idea, what got them excited? What were some of their suggestions on gameplay and mechanics and rewards? Um, and you know, I use that usually blends into the next part, which would be free writing and free drawing. So I'll usually take those player types and then I'll just start kind of writing down words, writing down mechanics, ideas. Uh, drawing a little bit um, if I can. I'm, I'm not a great drawler, so I do more with words. <laughs> and so, you know, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's that's like very graphical in, to, to, to use the word. I mean, you don't have to physically draw. The, the idea is that you can express your thoughts somehow. We, we recently did a, a course on architecture and they said you don't have to be a good drawer to be a good architect. You just need to be able to express what's in your head. And I think for you, it's exactly the same, whether that's in writing or whether that's drawing a, an ugly picture, which would be what I do. I'm a very <laughs> bad drawer, just like you. Uh, the important thing is to be able to put it in paper so that you can black and white so you can see it and, and refer back to it and get it out of your head. Yep, absolutely. So once I kind of have some doodles down and I have an idea of, of what, where I might want to go with it, um, I really like paper prototyping. Um, now, I don't usually do the, the literal cut it out of paper paper prototype some people do and if you do you know that's great um but i i usually draw you know a phone like for the app you know i'll, I'll draw a phone and draw features and you know i'll do the best that i can to kind of see how that works and then i'll go bug one of my coworkers and show other people and ask them what they think ask users what they think uh get feedback and then once i'm kind of happy with that i will uh create a lo-fi prototype uh, and what I usually use for that, so what I mean by that is something that kind of sort of functions and might be kind of sort of digital. So, you know, a, a little more concrete than a paper prototype. What I like to use is an app called um, Balsamic. I don't know if you've heard of Balsamic. Yeah. Mockups, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It creates mockups. And, and you can actually, 
you know, make it interactive and, and link the screens together. So I'll usually do that. Um, and then where that's helpful is, you know, if you've ever worked with a, with a designer or a developer, they need as much information as possible because so much can be misconstrued and you're a different person than that person. <laughs> and, and so creating that lo-fi prototype is very helpful for developers, uh, even in just understanding how they're going to make your data structure for whatever you're trying to implement, you know? <laughs> so, so then we move from that to, to implementation usually. And, and then from there, there's kind of a beta process of interviewing users, seeing what they think, getting their feedback, and, and then kind of uh, wash, rinse, and repeat after that with iteration. Makes a lot of sense, iteration. Once again, yeah. that's, a, that's a, key, a key thing to do with your, with your products, uh, engagers. Always make sure that you are iterating, that you're improving your product, because just like with the, the great tendency that they have now with startups, that you have to go with that minimum viable product and start improving, improving, improving. You never start improving. I mean, if you take a look at your phone every day, probably you'll get updates from the apps. And that's not just because they want to bug you. That's not because they 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 are they are they just want to keep you in the top of mind. It's because you, they're actually at least trying to improve the product. And that's something that you can do as well. Make sure that you're iterating so that you can get to your to your goals and to, you can do it better and more efficiently. Yep, absolutely. Okay, Scott, so now we're going to go to the second part of the interview. And here I'm going to challenge you because uh, I know that we both love this topic and it's it's easy to go on a rant and, and spend all the time that we can uh, speaking about this. But this is the second part. We're trying to go for short answers, all right? So I'm going to okay. make you a few questions um, and we're going to try to go for the, 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 the quick short answers, all right? So okay. the first one, the first answer that I, I want from you is for you to name for us one best practice for gamification? What would you consider best practice? Um, I think uh, one best practice would be to clearly identify your key performance indicators and your supporting metrics. That's great. I don't know. Yeah. That's great. That's a great thing because once again, once you set your objective, you have to make sure you're on track. And the only way is to have performance indicators. So the main, the key performance indicators are the ones that tell you, well, we are actually on track. So the next question would be, what's your favorite game? So my favorite game I'm currently playing would be Hearthstone. Uh, I'm excited for the new expansion coming out. Uh, and then past games uh, would be Final Fantasy VII, Diablo II, and Disciples II. Oh, sounds like you're such a gamer, huh? Yes, yeah. <laughs> So the next thing I would like to know, and this is a question that we've made to every everyone coming to, to the interviews, is who would you like to, to be interviewed? Who would you like to listen to in Professor Game? Uh, Jane McGonigal. Wow, that's a recurring answer. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure I'll ha we'll have her at some point for, for the interviews. Yes. What book would you recommend, recommend to our listeners? So my favorite book ever is uh, Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, he's actually a uh, from Indiana. He's a Hoosier. Um, <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with game design, but I'm still going to recommend it. Um, <laughs> Great. For, ga for game design, I'd say A Theory of Fun by Raf Koster. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a really good book uh, with great illustrations on each page. Really easy read. I uh, recommend that for game design, game theory. Um, and then for a YouTube channel, I'm real big on, on, on YouTube, watching YouTube, that is. I don't have a channel. Uh, <laughs> uh, game Maker's Toolkit by Mark Brown. Uh, is excellent, as well as Ahoy. Ahoy is really good as well. Okay, we'll put that on the, the show notes. Sure. Would you, would you give us some advice for, for the players who have never engaged the learners through game thinking? What would you tell them? Uh, start small. I think it's it's really easy to get excited and you know make a huge campaign, a huge game that you want to make, and, and that's good to write down uh, you know, all of those ideas that you have, but, you know, start small, get a core feedback loop and just do it. You just find users, talk to your friends, family, dogs, cats, whatever, and, <laughs> and just do it and iterate, fail fast, see what happens and write about it. If you can, you know, we need more postmortems. Um, that's really what will help the industry as a whole. So awesome. Um, how would you use game thinking to approach this problem? And this problem that we're going to present to you is, is a question that comes from our, from our audience uh, and it's selected randomly. We previously curated to make sure there's no, 
there's no promotion or anything of the sort that it's an actual question so the question we have for you today i'm gonna check it here randomized okay so this is an engineering professor all right he says i'm an engineering professor and i generally teach operations optimization in particular I'm struggling to get my students engaged in the class, and I must confess that I tend to be very theoretic about, except for some exercises. So he, in general, gives a, gives a lot of theory. Every once in a while, he does have a couple of exercises, but he still finds it hard for students to be excited about the topic. So he's asking us, how can I introduce gamification into my class? He's suggesting even that one of the, the classes he thinks could work for this is the one related to continuous improvement. So do you have any thoughts on that, Scott? Yeah, and I've actually been thinking about that a lot here lately in general, um, you know, how to use gamification in the classroom. And I think the real answer is that there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all answer because all students are different. And so, and, and students learn different, they are motivated differently. And so I think a good place to start, uh, if you're able, is to take an inventory of your class very early on, get to know them and figure out their player types. Find some kind of way to evaluate, you know, what really motivates them. Because you may not have, you know, I, I don't want to generalize too much, but I'm just going to say since it's an engineering class, okay. there may be more uh, achievers rather than socializers in there. So, you know, figure out what drives them at their core and then kind of, and then take approaches based on that rather than you know we're going to make this if you're in for instance if you're in an art class who will probably have a lot of explorers a lot of creative types you probably don't want to make that a, a competition you you probably won't it won't be effective to say okay you're all competing with each other and that's how we're going to become engaged in a classroom you would probably want to allow for more side quest type activities type game design uh, if you've got a classroom full of explorers so i think the first step is identifying your particular class, finding a way to do that, and then trying to alter what you're going to do by, you know, after finding those results. Now, I don't have a great answer. I know that makes it uh, <laughs> no, but that, pretty... that's that's the start of the process, and that's fundamental. How do you, where do you start? You start by knowing your players. You start by knowing your users, your learners. So uh, that's actually great advice. Um, uh, if you start up by there. And let's assume, for example, that it's true that what you said, that they tend to be achievers. So what techniques, maybe general game mechanics, would you suggest for, for achievers if it, if it were the case? So for achievers, achievers often, they, they like to see experience bars filled. You know, they're, they're the completionists uh, of the player <laughs> types. So you're going to want to find a way to, to visually... Uh, show them where they are like they, they want to know where they are on the scale and they want to see the finish line and so doing that as well as possible uh, I think is a way that you can kind of motivate them and, and sometimes you don't even necessarily have to change the structure of your class like how you're teaching it it's just a matter of giving meaningful feedback in a way uh, that, that motivates them in a more meaningful way that's great that's great Scott so Finally, I'd like to know for you to give our audience how we can connect with you, some final piece of quick advice, and then we'll say game over. Sure. So you can find me on Twitter uh, at Scott Rinke, uh, as well as you can email me anytime at uh, smrinke at bsu.edu. Uh, and my final word of advice, uh, especially for, uh, I think a lot, there's a lot of people that are interested in gamification and game design now that aren't necessarily uh, in the field or, or aren't really gamers quite yet. Um, and my advice would be to play games, to play as many and as, as diverse games as possible because, you know, if you ask anyone, how do you become a better writer, they, they tell you to read. Uh, you know, <laughs> they tell you to study what's, you know, what, what other people have done. So, you know, just use, be mindful of the games that you play. Think about what the creator was thinking when they made it um, and just, just play games. Great advice. So be, become a gamer, a bit of a gamer at least, to understand games better. Especially even if you are not a video game player, I would suggest as well that you play some games, even if you want just to analyze them, to get the best out of them and to use something like gamification, which is using all these techniques, all the things that were used to engage 
the people on a game, you can use it for something else, for example, for your classroom. So thank you very much, Scott, for joining us here at Professor Game. And well, it's time to say game over. Bye bye, Scott. Bye. Thanks. Engagers, thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast. If you want more interviews with incredible guests like Scott and lots of awesomeness from Professor Game, take a minute to subscribe and rate this podcast on iTunes. You can find the direct link on professorgame.com slash slash iTunes. Why iTunes? Because this will help us reach other engagers who will be your allies to make education amazing using gamification. Hey, and by the way, if you like the show and want a free gift, then subscribe, give us a five-star rating and a positive review on iTunes. Then send a screenshot where you show this to professor at professorgame.com with review gift in the subject line, and we'll send it to you. Before you click continue for your next mission, would you like to know what a gamification conference looks like? We will be talking about Gamification Europe on a special episode next week. We'll have Pete Jenkins from the Gamification Confederation and Gamification Plus. Listen to the next episode of Professor Game next week. See you there.